I do think that when they chose moderators for these panels, they had a particular look in mind. Uh, Dan Coyce and I were kind of comparing hairlines and glasses and v-neck sweaters and thought, all right. <laughs> so welcome. Um, my name is Doug French. I am the co-founder of the Dad 2.0 Summit, which is a, an annual social media conference devoted to amplifying the voice of modern fatherhood. Um, and uh, basically, uh, to explain it, it, we do have a, ultimately we talk, we do a lot of content campaigns with brands. We do a lot with our, with our, our branding partners, our title sponsor this year and for the last three years has been Dove Men Plus Care, which is interesting when you consider that I met with Men Care this morning. And uh, Dove Men Plus Care has a Super Bowl ad coming up called Care Makes a Man Strong. Um, so uh, there's a lot going on here with, with men and caring that I find very gratifying because we're going to talk about a bit of the spectrum of how, um, how men are perceived in the media and how that really helps move the needle to affecting real change at the policy level uh, and in the opinion level, in the hearts and minds of, of the, the young people that we're all trying to raise um, and, um, and, and, and just basically what I'd like to do, what all the dads, the influencers in my conference uh, are about, are trying to leave our sons particularly, uh, but our daughters as well, but to have our sons in, uh, inherit a more enlightened idea of what masculinity is than currently what kind of passes for it. So, um, and since there is just the two of us, um, you may, you may be expecting Mark Sherwood. He is uh, the executive at Saatchi and Saatchi behind the, uh, the Cheerios How to Dad campaign. He is uh, Snowmageddon back in New York. But we are fortunate to have uh, another co-founder with me. This is uh, Simon Isaacs, who is the co-founder of Fatherly, which uh, rather than have me describe it, it's better from his own words. So um, Simon, take it away. Sure. So um, Fatherly is a parenting site, an online parenting site. Um, focused on guys, um, and guys with kids. So my, the story essentially is what you probably think. Is, uh, my, my wife, she at the time thought she was pregnant and, and she started signing up for all of the baby centers and babbles and what to expect. And so I did too as a sensitive new age guy um, and realized that everything out there is pink, purple, and turquoise um, and that there's nothing out there for guys. And why does this matter? It matters because if you look down the downstream, the majority of bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, and PhDs are all, all focused on women. 60% of kids are growing up in dual income households, right? With the rise of women. There was a book you, many of you might be familiar with called The End of Men. But I, I think what we're actually all seeing is the rise of dad. Um, and, uh, and there's nothing out there. There's 4.2 million mom blogs. And, and, and thanks to the work of, of, of Doug and, and so many others, um, there's a, a growing community of, of dad bloggers. And what we saw is the opportunity to provide real support, individual or a consumer focused platform um, focusing on, on dad. Um, and uh, after a year of testing we, and scaling, and uh, we just raised a big seed round and, and are, are now growing pretty, um, pretty well. We are so hot right now. <laughs> um, and you will see during the Super Bowl, you will be, the, the, it'll be a data palooza. You will see lots of ads. Many of them are available for viewing now online. Yeah, I think right now it's, uh, it's about six ads. Dove, Toyota, yep. Nissan, um, Coke to a lesser extent has a dad component to it. BMW has a dad component. That's 150, what is it, 115 million person audience uh, who's going to be exposed to advertising. And I'm going to basically, I'm going to DVR the game and fast forward through the football and watch the ads. Um, um, deflated balls notwithstanding. Um, I think, so when we talk about the perception of, of fatherhood, I think a lot of what, again, moves the needle is what people see on TV. I think it's a very powerful thing. Obviously, we all would like to believe that parenting is first and foremost leading by example and trying to, because great, great men are not born, they're built. Uh, and that's a lot to do with, uh, again, with, with Dove Men Plus Care as our title sponsor, and our media partner is Esquire Magazine. So, uh, and speaking about the last panel, when we were talking about what makes it cool, uh, we were very excited because I, if you saw Esquire Magazine's fatherhood issue for Father's Day in June, it was superlative. I mean, they brought in all sorts of really well-respected, interesting, funny, non-bro-like men 
to talk about fatherhood and caring in a very specific way, and it resonated mm -hmm. very well. And I basically camped out in the hallway at Hearst uh, magazines until they agreed to be our, our media partner. And they're going to be in San Francisco with us in three weeks to, uh, to help uh, bring the idea of fatherhood to a men's perspective. I mean, as a dad blogger and as, as a, I've been, I was dad blogging, I imagine, I've been since about 2003, and there was about three of us. Um, and to see, uh, last year we had a parents magazine talk about fatherhood, which was terrific, but to have a men's magazine embrace fatherhood in this way is, is truly extraordinary. And that, that kind of speaks to the perception of how you see fathers um, and how they're portrayed in mass media, like on television shows um, and advertising and in magazines. And I think that's a huge part of how we just shift perception to the point where, I mean, I remember growing up and, and reading that, you mean women couldn't always vote? Why is that? You know, that's, that, what's that about? And it, to the, much the same way that my kids will grow up wondering, you know, there was a time when gay people couldn't marry each other, what's that about? It's all perspective and I think years from now, I, you know, when we, when we approach, when we, we work toward the ideal of a gender neutral meritocracy when it comes to parenting, um, that's what I think perception is a big part of that and that's a lot of why when Dad 2.0 started four years ago, there was a big controversy with, uh, with Huggies diapers and how they were marketing to moms by saying, boy, if dads can handle them, anybody can. And, uh, and they came to Dad 2.0 after the blowback and they confronted that head on, came to meet with us, changed their whole uh, program around and received great ROI on that. And that was a great case precedent. To the point now, if you look around, we have, you know, part of our job is to be kind of a watchdog and look at what sort of ads are out there you don't see a lot of doofus dads anymore. You see a lot of dads who love what they do and are presented in a very specific, not over earnest way, not over macho way. I mean, there, there's all sorts of nuance to it, but um, the next, so the next step is to talk about affecting change in this town and, uh, and talking about paternity leave and talking about mentoring. Sure, but I think, and, you know, um, I, and to that regard, yes, and father, yeah, I would we're say gonna talk a lot about the Venn diagram in terms of <laughs> how, you know, how Father Lee and, and Dad 2.0 are working together to try and make this happen. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things. I mean, historically, uh, let's sort of look back, and there's a interplay between both sort of what's happening cultur culturally as, a, as well as what's happening politically and economically. So how did we get here is part of the question. Why, uh, why when you open the New York Ti Sunday Times or the Washington Post, it's like there's a story about um, stay-at-home dads and there's a story of, you know it's just every week you see this is a story about paternity leave so part of it is um, guys happen to lose their jobs at a you know much for, you know guys lost their jobs during the recession didn't get get them back in time as, as much as women did we have the rise of the women's movement we have everything else that's happening we have uh, like it or not we have the sort of what you might call the lean-in um, and so there's that component then to Doug to your point you also have this incredible transition in culture and the, probably the best place to look at it is on television. And so you start with like Leave It to Beaver and then you move through and you get to Al Bundy and then you keep going and you get to Homer Simpson and Tim the Toolman Taylor and now you're at like we have Parenthood and for Transparent and four million other depictions of what modern day fatherhood you is. We did that, right? It was like decade fatherhood through the decades. Yeah, his t it's really interesting. Also, on, the, on on TV ads are the same thing, and so it, you, you know we can, you can go on fatherly and sort of take a look at that. But I think there's this interplay between culture, policy, and economics that is happening. Um, and the question now is, what do we what do we do with it, and where does it all go? Um, um, and it's something that now I think brands are trying to wrestle with. Brands are are very much focused have or and have so have been really focused on marketing and selling to mom. Right? They used to there used to be this belief that 80% of all purchases uh, were were handled by women. Last year, 52% of all grocery shopping was done by men. So brands are trying to figure out how they connect, and that's part of why you see where you're going to see it on Sunday. Um, there's families trying to figure this out. Right? If 60% if of kids are in, growing up in dual income households, parents are juggling and trying to figure out who's on first and who's on second and who's picking up the kid um, and who's doing the grocery shopping. And, 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 um, and then of course there's all sorts of implications uh, you know, for family welfare. So um, I don't know where I'm, ram but where I'm going <laughs> with rambling with all this, but it's, it, we're at this sort of really interesting sort of nexus point in between culture and politics.
Well, I think when you see a lot of, when you see how, um, how extraordinarily well dads are being portrayed right now, uh, I mean, I, we point to a number of, and again, I, I never like to point to things as successes because I'm just a, I like to keep, a, I, I really like to stay grounded on things and I rarely, I rarely um, um, linger on things. But I think if we do point to what we've, how, if we point to what, what our success is so far, especially from a blogger's point of view and a part of it as a grassroots effort to, uh, to kind of confront the headwind that is fatherhood and fatherly behavior, not fatherly behavior, but fatherly behavior. Um, because there are plenty of unfortunate stories about what some dads are still capable of doing, and that's the headwind we're fighting. And so we want to amplify the voice of the middle. Again, our journalism lives in extremes, and it's more newsworthy to say, you won't believe what this dad did. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are terrible stories out there that get a lot of headway, and, and our anchors on our boat. And I think what, uh, I'm keeping a lot of sailing metaphors alive today. <laughs> but I think more than anything else, if you keep the drumbeat going and you, and you have dads talking about ordinary strikes of life, how it's not so much that they do for their kids because, that's, because it's expected, but rather because they love to do for their kids. And that's the data that we're seeing. We're not doing this because we feel obligated to. We're not helping out mom. We're doing this because we love to do it. And the data are coming out saying that a number of men who are working on work-life balance or as it's being for, uh, upgraded to work-life integration because now management, you know, now uh, business schools are looking into this and trying to present bottom line issues to, to whether it's empl their employees. When you look at that and work-life balance, that's something that lots of men are ticking that box. I really want to be home for my kids' soccer game. I want to make dinner for them. And that's part of the corporate culture. And that comes from the perception. And that's why we love um, as a man, I, again, I've been blogging now for 12 years, but the millennials, uh, the younger dads, they don't, they don't deal with stereotypes. They don't care about them, nor do the young moms. They know that it's just a question of let's divide and conquer, assuming we can get away with one income. But let's see if whoever stays home stays home and whoever works works. And if we can do two, let's play to our strengths, let's divide and conquer and do the best we can. And I think that's what is... is so much of this is just evolution beyond what didn't work doesn't need to work anymore. It doesn't need to be part of the conversation anymore. Sure. I, th I mean, at the same time, I think we're painting a very rosy picture of sort of based on what's happening in our audience and what's happening in the, in the, in the, in the cultural space, that, that things are going great. And, they, and in many ways that they, they are. We do a lot of work with Fortune 500 and Fortune 50 companies syndicating fatherly content in through their corporate intranets helping HR and ER and employee resource group teams who are trying to figure out how do you support working dads and working parents um, do so. And what you hear from them is, and there's a lot of amazing progressive companies who are offering incredible benefits programs, but many dads aren't taking advantage of them. Um, and uh, you know, there's all sorts of statistics on the sort of stay-at-home dad side where you know, 60 per plus percent of guys would like to be a stay-at-home dad at some point, and more than 68% would never do so because they feel like they, you know, there would be some stigma around it. Most of that stigma, I would say, is probably self-stigma, um, and that, I think, is what happens in the, in the workplace. And so changing culture is the way that you get guys to opt into that corporate dad's group um, or flex time or taking advantage of all of these things. Um, and so that is where the advertising and television, media sites and bloggers and other influencers and any other way that you can shape culture um, becomes really, really important. You know, but it's, it's very pervasive. And so in a couple of, uh, well, hopefully I have at least four weeks until uh, my daughter's born. Uh, He's uh, so adorable. <laughs> It could be any day. I have um, two tween age sons. <laughs> Holy crap. And, you know, the truth is... There's just no other word for it. My, my apologies. No. No, but, I mean, We're having a child. Yay. Yeah, totally. Exactly. Exactly. And I don't know what the heck I'm going to do um, as, a, as an entrepreneur, which is another conversation of what does paternity leave look like in the age of the modern job? Uh, what does paternity leave look like for a freelancer, for a Uber driver? Um, those are decisions that people have to make on their own, and the only way to affect that is not going to be at the, at the policy level, although I think that was a really nice point about if you do shape policy, you can act, policy shapes culture. Um, 
but we do need to ad address that. I think I'm going to be taking two weeks, but again, as an entrepreneur, I uh, run and own several companies. Um, that means I need to figure it out, and I'll need to do a little bit here and a little bit there, and and um, baby in this arm. And exactly, <laughs> laptop in this, and and the and, Heisman trophy. and how to be a the Heisman carry. Exa Heisman, the Heisman carry and yet not bonus. Be, and, and be yeah. present to all of it. Yes, so. exactly. I love you, honey. What's Exactly. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think, and because we are, we, when we talk about perception again, I think you, you 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 build men to believe a certain different way, and so and the stigma, as you mentioned, is a huge part of it. Um, not least, uh, and I think when you talk about, um, we talk a lot about paternity leave, and again, that's a that's also a very important point because paternity leave right now only speaks to a certain a certain layer of, of workers and that's it's for for many others it's a pervasive problem that we have so much more to talk about and get through um, but when you look when you talk about someone like Daniel Murphy the second baseman for the Mets who took his three days paternity leave during the baseball season and Boomer Esiason gave us the ultimate gift by asserting on the radio that he should have made his, his wife get a c-section before the season started <laughs> and and then and then the world descended on Boomer Esiason, and Boomer Esiason got a quick education. Um, and and that's, if we can expose the dinosaurs for what they are, you can see when, that, when, when people react in that very uh, life-affirming way to tell the man to back off a bit, and then recognize that, or when you see something like, you know, Intel last week launched, they have a new policy of eight weeks of bonding leave. They don't call it paternity leave or maternity leave or any of that. It's, they want to call it for what it is. You're not there to help your, your wife. You're there to bond with your kid. And we're going to talk about that at Dad 2.0 next month, about how bonding, even at that early stage, is the launching pad for a lifelong relationship with your kid. And that's what bonding leave is for. That's paternity leave. It's not like, honey, can I get you a glass of water? It's, I'm your father. I want to meet you. So when you see even word choices yeah. like that, or when the platform gets raised to that, uh, and you may have seen right when Daniel Murphy had the trouble, and he was actually here speaking about that at, at, the, at the White House for the Working Father Summit last, uh, last summer. Um, and then um, um, Chris Hayes was on, was on paternity leave at the same time. And he called out Broomer Esiason and Mike Frances and said, no, I'm here to bond with my kid. I'm not here to help out. Right. When that gets elevated to the platform as it is and as it will, that's where I think the perception really shifts for the, for the irrevocably. So two points on that. One, I think there's an incredible role of influencers. Um, so that's something that we do. Um, uh, five minutes. All right. So on the influencer side, um, you know, we have conversations weekly with everybody from Tata, who's Jay-Z's right hand, um, who happens to be a dad. And we talk to him about his whole life, not just about fatherhood, but everything in between, because that's the gray area that dads live in. Uh, we talk to Arnie Duncan about you know, parent-teacher conferences and what it's like to be a secretary of education. Going to that, we talk to pro athletes. We, talk to, we have a, a talk coming up with John Bon Jovi and Justin Timberlake and Jimmy Kimmel and so on and so forth. Um, and hopefully, and it's, it's about, and I guess this goes to my point, it doesn't always, if you want to shape culture around fatherhood and paternity leave, we don't necessarily just need to focus on father and paternity leave. Don't talk to a guy just about as being a fa father, but talk to him about being a guy who is also a father and have that stuff be integrated. Uh, we don't need to have these, it's awesome that Esquire does, you know, my only thing with Esquire is do integrate that Father's Day kind of content across the year. Um, because that's who your who your new who your audience actually is, um, and, and so it's finding that intersection between men's interest and parenting um, that I think. That, and if we can sort of integrate that, um, and not just talk about paternity leave, or not just talk about the stay-at-home dad, but talk about awesome guys who are also dads and how they how they learn are learning things in their home that they're bringing on the field or in the office and vice versa, um, that becomes really interesting. Well, that's a great point too because I think, you know, we, we work in PR a lot. The Dad to Summit's uh, parent company is XY Media and we create content campaigns using dads and much as, 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 as with moms have been doing for years. And uh, we used to only get like the floodgates would only open in May for June campaigns for, for you know, right. for dads and grads. You know, it's like, well, there's Mother's Day and like, and the dads are with the graduates. You know, and we don't see dads and grad stuff anymore. And so be, as, as the PR pitches to us become a year-round thing, 
I do think, I mean, Esquire did make that foray, let's do this once and see what happens. And I, like anything else, you can, you can forgive them for dipping their toe in the water to the point where I think they will follow suit. Mm -hmm. I think when totally. you see that, there will be a tectonic shift. Totally. Um, we have about, if you'd like, if anyone any comments or questions, we have a few minutes before we go. Yeah. Okay. I'm Monique Moore. I'm a s clinical psychologist, and I specialize in helping working families, and especially new parents. Um, I think there's a little bit of an elephant in the room here from the boots-on-the-ground perspective, which is that a lot of women are um, finding their narratives of what it means to be a woman and a caretaker challenged as more men step up to the role of father. And what I hear in my practice a lot of times is men wanting to get more involved and women really shutting them out. Mm -hmm. sure. So I yeah. think sort of a corollary to this fantastic movement and discussion is how do we help women redefine what it is to be a, a caretaker and a woman and a mother? And the, uh, in some ways, I think that issue is a little bit more complex. And the second thing is um, I will testify that I have been seeing marriages break over the issue of household responsibilities. Uh -huh. And <laughs> it's a, you know, again, it's a different issue, but you know, everyone's struggling for time now. And if you can put in a few plugs for men helping to do the dishes and uh, laundry and uh, encouraging them to be masculine men and helping on those fronts too, I know a lot of wives and mothers be tremendously appreciative, <laughs> thanks. Totally. Well, I think, uh, to, to the quick point, I think number one, um, there's, as it is now, the, the, the bar of what it means to be a, a, a successful mother and woman is ridiculously high, and the bar for a, for a father is ridiculously low. Nobody dies and dad's a hero. And our, our goal is to try and see how those, I th you know, society, one of the ancillary benefits I hope of this is that the pressure on moms to be perfect will come down. And it's interesting, when you look at the blogs, the blogosphere, there were so many mom blogs that are like, crappy mom, shitty mom, uh, mom needs a cocktail, drink, you know, and, and there's, there, there's, there is that element of... And then there's superhero dad. Yeah, you don't see like <laughs> terrible dad blogs because we can't afford that, number one. But number two, it's, it's a way of women saying, take us off this pedestal and let's not buy into... Um, what, what the pressures that are imposed upon us. And I think that's going to be a shift as well when you see, as, as this gender neutral meritocracy hopefully uh, glacially moves towards something we can point to as a more enlightened way to look at this. But um, it's, it is changing, and 36% of men are the primary, uh, do the, uh, say that they are the primary person who does the laundry. Um, I don't know the statistic on dishwashing. Um, but it is, it, is, it is changing, and actually you can even see, how, if you want to see how it's changing again, advertising is always a good place to look, and you can see lots of ads where guys are in, engaged in that. So I do think that we're seeing it, I think, in your on your point on complexity, I just think it's all complex. I think work-life balance is complex, I think the workforce conversations are complex, child care conversations, who does the dishes, who takes the kids out. I think it's just families, are we are at a very awkward point um, in all of this and families are really struggling and of course breaking up over over sort of these all of these different tensions. But I do think that you make headway into the complexity when you climb these simplistic foothills. When you when you people just in the back of their mind they're thinking there were two billion fantastic ads about dads during the Super Bowl or my dad was home when I was a kid or you know my mom worked and my mom doesn't know where the laundry detergent is. <laughs> which you see a lot of that going on. I mean, the dads in, my, in our group are like, I'm not sure I can leave my wife alone with the kids while I'm at dad 2.0. <laughs> you know, and that's, anytime you can upend stereotypes and upend perceptions of what you think that should be, that's basically how there's no default. The default is we are a unit. Let's play to our strengths. I mean, I'm a co-parent. I'm, I'm a divorced dad and thankful for it in many ways. There, come, there, there comes a, a great time when you're happy that, She's not your wife anymore, but she's still the mother of your kids. And, you, and so I'm, I, firsthand, it's all about partnership and like, okay, well, this has to get done. How do we do it? 
And um, it's a great, it's, it, if, if, if that's the pattern that we aspire to in the longest term, I think we're going to affect some, some long standing and, and particular change. All right, thank you very much.